going to speak a bit about secondary prevention in issues. It has been already commented in this workshop, uh, uh, but uh, I think that maybe we should uh, start from the beginning and we, and I want to explain you exactly what is an issues. Um, you, you, ha you have heard again this, 85% uh, 85, 85 of strokes are ischemic, and in about a quarter of them, we cannot find the theology of the stroke. They were, were, and they were called before cryptogenic stroke, and it's a very high, um, it has a very high incidence. It's a very important uh, disease. So uh, it's very relevant to know what to, to do with these patients. A subgroup of these cryptogenic strokes are uh, thought to be caused by uh, thromboembolism, and, the, and there was the proposed to establish a new category in, in 2014 that is the embolic stroke of undetermined source. Uh, source. And this is the definition. It's a non-lacunar brain infarct without large artery stenosis or, cardi or cardioembolic sources. So it's, um, it was proposed by a, by a working experts working group to, to find a more clinically useful and positively uh, defined entity uh, than cryptogenic strokes that implies a, a stepwise approach to diagnosis and that uh, uh, increase our knowledge about the imaging and the pathophysiology of this disease. So um, I'll put you one example. There is, uh, imagine this 70s six-year-old male with vascular risk factors that arrives to the hospital with fluctuating right hand paresia and aphasia. So we do the workup in this patient and we found this. Uh, an atrial fibrillation in his EKG, a severe carotid stenosis and infarction in the MRI. So is an embolic stroke? Yeah, yes, it's an embolic stroke. You can see in the imaging that there is an infarction in the cortical area of the brain. It's not subcortical, and uh, uh, you could uh, know it before because it has a, a clinical sign of cortical uh, affectation that is an aphasia. So it's an embolic stroke. But uh, is cryptogenic? Yes, it's also cryptogenic because we have two possible etiologies: the atrial fibrillation and the severe carotid stenosis. So this is not an issues. Um, cryptogenic stroke can, can be uh, defined because we, can, we don't complete the diagnostic workup or because we, we find two possible etiologies for our stroke. But an issues has to be non-lacunar. You have to rule out occlusive large artery sclerosis and you have to rule out major cardioembolic sources. So, non-lacunar, you know the lacunar infarction are small infarctions in the subcortical area of the brain uh, below 1.5 or 2 millimeters of diameter in the neuroimaging, and you can, you, you can, oh, sorry, oops, <laughs> uh, okay. yeah, you can demonstrate it in the neuroimaging because you have a big infarction or a cortical infarction and you have a great vessel occlusion in any of your uh, diagnostic procedures. Again, you have to rule out occlusive large artery sclerosis of the uh, arteries that uh, go to the territory of the infarction by a Doppler or arteriogram or a neuroimaging. And you have to rule out major cardioembolic sources. And for this, the recommendations are do you have to need a minimum of an EKG, 24 hours uh, EKG monitoring, and a transthoracic echocardiogram. So, and you also have to rule out uh, uh, infrequent stroke etiologies like uh, carotid dissection, vasculitis, etc. In the end, after all this diagnostic workup, you will define an issue, and then what? Well, 
there is a high amount of tests that you can perform after all these primary tests to try to find exactly the theology of the, of the issues. But uh, actually, the usual suspects, the main etiologies possible for these issues patients, are covered atrial fibrillation, non stenos and atherosclerotic, and, in, and paradoxal embolism or, or ventricular dysfunction. So, why is the, and this so important? Why are we so uh, intensively uh, aimed to find the theology of the stroke? Well, because we don't know which, which is the best treatment for these patients. Should we give, should, should we give just antiplatelets? Should we do, be more aggressive? Um, we don't know. Uh, in 2013, this, uh, the Cochrane published this uh, review, this meta-analysis of eight trials comparing anti-vitamin K antagonist against antiplatelets in patients with a transient ischemic attack or minor ischemic stroke of arterial origin, that is now an issue probably, and uh, they weren't able to find a, reduce, uh, a, a reduction in the in the proportion in the recurrence of ischemic stroke and they even found an increase in the composite of vascular death, non-fatal stroke or myocardial infarction or major bleeding complications. And this was especially caused because uh, in the group of moderate or intensive um, anticoagulation, the, the risk of bleeding complications was very increased. So that's all. We shouldn't give them antiplatelets. We should give them antiplatelets, and that's all. Well, um, we should not be calm with this because uh, this is a very recent trial, and you ca you can see the the high uh, risk of recurrence and of vascular death that these patients have. So issues is a real problem, and we need to to study more on, the, on them to try to find which is the best treatment in this kind of patients. Um, in this uh, study, the authors uh, wanted to test the, um, the scales that you know, the chat and chat basque, to see if they could identify those patients with higher risk of recurrence of mortality. And actually they found that uh, Patients with a high chest and chest backs have a very increased risk of of uh, recurrence and of mort uh, and, um, and of vascular death, with a very very high um, or ratio. So this is a good tool to identify those patients with with risk of uh, of uh, problems later. So. And why? Maybe it's influenced because we think that uh, a high proportion of these issues patients are caused because of a, co of a covert atrial fibrillation. And it has been commented before in the, in the controversy, uh, the, the yield of the, of the EKG monitoring and to, uh, it depends on how long you monitor these patients you will find an, um, a higher or not uh, increase in the detection of atrial fibrillation. But um, what should we do? Should we treat and then monitoring? Or should we monitor and then train? Should we wait uh, three months to see with my monitor, my, my EKG monitoring to see if my patient has some atrial fibrillation until I found him with an hemiplegia in, at home? Uh, I don't know. It's uh, something we we need to to work on. Maybe we could uh, select those patients that we think that have a very high risk of recurrence and be more aggressive with them, especially if they have a low risk of bleeding. And then for how long should we do the monitoring? Again, it has been commented before, but uh, what if I don't detect an atrial fibrillation? Uh, 
If I started with uh, NOAC, should I change to antiplatelets if I don't find the atrial fibrillation in my monitoring? We don't know neither. So I think, uh, again, the answer is in the clinical trials. Uh, we know there are three clinical trials comparing NOACs with antiplatelets in issues patients, but uh, what they, they said before, the um, Today, we have uh, bad news of the first trial that was uh, stopped in October, uh, Navigate Esus, that who, which compared Rivaroxaban with aspirin, was stopped because of futility, and we don't know yet the uh, data about uh, safety, and we will have to wait uh, to the results of the other Esus trials to, to see if we need to change our protocols in Esus treatments. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, excellent presentation, please. Just a comment, uh, Samantha. I think it's no large artery atherosclerosis with more than 50% stenosis. Yeah. But if you have less than 50% stenosis, it's still issues. I'm not sure that it's correct, but this is the definition. The definition may, um, we can discuss that some patients with lower than 50% stenosis may have a vulnerable plaque and it's the theology of the stroke, but uh, the definition is, is that.